and Richard Wellington came to us from England. So we appreciate the travels they've made in order to come speak to us. Uh, we did put an article about them in Meridian Magazine and caused quite a stir. stir. We probably got uh, more hits on our website from that article than, than uh, many we put up in a long time, so we really appreciate that. Um, I also want to mention right up front that if you like what you hear, they're also going to be speaking, I don't have my glasses on, um, Friday evening, August 8th, 7 to 9 p.m., the 6th to 8th LDS Ward Chapel, which is at 300 North, 100 East, at American Fork. So that's Friday, 7 to 9, uh, American Fork, 300 North, 100 East. They're going to talk, talk more about this and put on a longer presentation. So we'll get just a taste of what they have. And to give them more time, I'm just going to turn it over to them. Thank you, Scott and Fair. My first part is... She wore the shirt. <laughs> and uh, I live in the peaceful land of Saudi Arabia. I'm president of the Nephi Project. It's a group of LDS and non-LDS who are still doing some research on the ice trail in Arabia. We're going to uh, pass down through the rows a little card here. If you'd like to receive an email newsletter from us, it's free. Uh, please sign it and send it back down the aisle. Thank you, Vicki. Now, I can also go to our website, which is nephiproject.com, and see what we've been doing over there. It's really an honor for me uh, to speak to you today because I have my partner here. It's the first time in the U.S. I've ever had the chance to do a presentation with uh, my exploring partner and uh, dear friend Richard Willington. Um, and so I really, uh, it's a real privilege for me. Now what were we doing in the northwest corner of Saudi Arabia where research began? Uh, we were trying to find the Saudi Arabian or the Arab Arabian candidate for Mount Sinai. And after several attempts, we found the mountain. That led us then to a town called Al Bada, which is uh, by oral tradition there, the home of Jethro. The uh, assistant to the mayor of the town told us that, oh, if you're really interested in Moses, what you should see is the waters of Moses on the uh, Gulf of Aqaba. So we traveled there, and what we found was a candidate, what we would call a qualified candidate for the Valley of Lemuel. Now, why is that important that we find a qualified candidate for the value of land. Well, if critics of the Book of Mormon are going to find fault with the Book of Mormon. The obvious place to start is in Jerusalem, because we have a clear point of embarkment on the Book of Mormon account. So it'd be very easy to start there and then follow Nephi's writing and see if it holds up to what's actually there in the desert. Critics have already come out with very strong assertions. For example, there are no rivers in Arabia. How could there be a river of Laman? There never have been any timbers or trees growing in Oman by which Nephi could build a ship. There are geographical errors in the Book of Mormon. On the other hand, if you could prove that first Nephi is an accurate historical account, then it would follow that the rest of the Book of Mormon was divinely inspired. Richard? It's a pleasure to be here, and um, George and I haven't had a chance. We've been trying to organize this from thousands of miles apart, so you have to excuse us if we are. Uh, just uh, putting our act together here a little bit. But um, if you remember, uh, cast your minds back to, to Lehi's departure from Jerusalem. Uh, we're told that he uh, goes into the wilderness. And um, there were a number of routes that could have taken him 
to the Gulf of Aqaba, where they end up at the Red Sea, some of which traveled along the uh, western part of the, the uh, Dead Sea and down to Wadi Araba. Um, but we will just present what we feel, because we don't have time to go into all the details. If you need more, then um, by all means go into the book. But um, we feel that they headed here, immediately across the plain of uh, Jericho, and picked up the route which runs down uh, the length of Arabia, which used to be used for uh, trade and so on. Uh, there are a number of reasons why we believe that. First of all, we're told that um, when uh, Zedekiah, King Zedekiah, if you remember when Jerusalem finally fell uh, to Nebuchadnezzar's army as the walls were breached, he fled through the gate that was uh, near his garden, and he fled east, and um, because that was the quickest way out of uh, out of uh, Israelite territory. He was captured on the plains of uh, Jericho. We're also told that many other residents of Judah did the same thing when Nebuchadnezzar's army came. There seems to be a historical precedent for heading east to get away quickly. And um, Hugh Nibley and others, uh, as pointed out by uh, Kent Brown here, um, have put together an impressive array of evidence that points to Lehi's exodus as a replication of that of the Israelites. In other words, we believe that one of the reasons why Nephi uses the Exodus as a teaching tool to lay millennials so often is because it's a reproduction, it's a mirror of the journey they took, so it was directly relevant to lay millennial. The route that we would suggest they took, it takes them here across the uh, north of the Dead Sea. Now, can I just point out this little arrow here, because uh, I'm going to be talking a little about Wadi El Kara in a moment. So when you see the photographs, we're talking about an area about two miles north of the Dead Sea and about a mile to the east of the uh, River Jordan. As they were heading east from here, they had an opportunity to pick up two different roads. One of them was called the King's Highway, and the other one was known as the Way of the Wilderness. The King's Highway, um, well in that case, I'll tell you what, let's just move on to the next picture. If you take a look at the route of the Exodus, uh, this is uh, taken from the, the maps and the new and the new maps of the LDS uh, scriptures. Uh, the route of the Exodus came across the uh, Plain Jericho to pick up the way of the wilderness, and then at this portion here came down to join up with the King's Highway, and which eventually brought them down to Easy and Gaber, which is on the uh, Gulf of Aqaba. Could this be called um, traveling in the wilderness? Well, we believe that, that it certainly could. I mentioned this area known as. Uh, Wadi El Kara, immediately on the uh, north of the Dead Sea. Well, this was the area where John the Baptist was preaching. We were told that he was preaching in the wilderness. And recently, the church has been found at Wadi El Kara, which marks the place where John the Baptist preached and where Elijah was taken up into heaven. And uh, I had an opportunity to go and visit that. It's in Jordan a few years ago. At that point, it wasn't open to the public, but it may well be open now. If any of you ever go to Jordan, you might want to see it. This is the, um, the church here, and on the other side of the wadi, there's a, a small building which marks the area where John the Baptist preached. This is where Elijah was meant to have been taken up into heaven. This is according to the, um, uh, the, uh, the pilgrim of Bordeaux, who wrote about this in 233 AD. So to bring them to the way of the wilderness, why would we say they travelled in the way of the wilderness? Well, we believe that Lehi, when he departed, took uh, used camels. Uh, this isn't our idea. Nibby argues very ably to, to say this. Uh, just the tents they would have lived in would have been far too heavy for a man to carry. And when you travel by camel, uh, one of the things you were looking for was a route which was flat and where the sand was compacted enough that the camels could travel easily. And so camel trains used to use uh, the way of the wilderness here, even though there was less water and um, less rainfall and less fodder because it was an easier route for camels to pass over. As they headed further south, they would have joined into the King's Highway. Now, the King's Highway is an area in, in uh, Jordan which travels through mountains in its northern portion. And uh, the route was there because it's an area of highest rainfall. And so the majority of biblical towns and uh, archaeological sites in Jordan actually sit on the King's Highway. There was lots of farmland there, and it was well populated, so it wouldn't really have counted as wilderness per se. But when you get to the southern area, the southern portion, the rainfall here drops to less than 100 millimeters a year, and it's uh, far less populated. 
And so heading onto the King's Highway there, we feel we'll still be considered traveling in the wilderness. This is um, the, high, the, King, the modern highway, which uh, follows the route of the old highway across Wadi Mojib. And in the bottom of here, there's an old Roman 